it's just such a crazy time. Mm. Uh, and people need more help than ever, which is why I'm grateful to you and uh, all the support you give to people who follow you. No, yeah, I really appreciate that, Dr. Eamon. I thought it was really important to have a discussion around, obviously, one of the, um, probably one of the most famous uh, Olympians that America has at the moment, yeah. And her decision. Yeah, one of the most famous in history. Um, yeah. And it's, it's heartbreaking mm. that, uh, it, it's heartbreaking, but at the same time, it normalizes that anybody, anybody who has too much stress can decompensate. And despite the wild level of stress she's under, she still came out and rooted for her teammates. And I think that goes to her character. And, you know, I often talk about how fame has side effects. Yeah. That I've been blessed. Uh, you know, that Miley Cyrus and Justin Bieber and a whole host of other really well-known people um, I've gotten to help. And I've just clearly seen fame wears out the pleasure centers in your brain so she's not just an athlete no. that she's a media star and a business person and you know people often don't get that gymnasts have a very high um experience with traumatic brain injuries and when you saw the first vault that she did um that's extremely dangerous. Oh, yeah. I can and imagine. if your head's not right, you can damage your brain. Mm. And so I think, you have know, you that gymnasts may have... into the clinics personally? Have you seen any gymnastic injuries? Many. Oh, you have? It's, it's actually one of the most dangerous sports for okay. children. Because when you watch what they do, either on the vault or on the rings it's like well how do you learn to do this yeah. and it's often you learn by making mistakes mm -hmm. and those mistakes people don't understand your brain is soft about the consistency of soft butter tofu custard somewhere between egg whites and jello and your skull is really hard and your skull has sharp bony ridges mm -hmm. And when you damage the brain, people get depressed. They get anxious. They don't perform quite as well as they did before. And we now have a database of about 187,000 scans. And if you go, hey, Daniel, what's the single most important lesson from this large number of brain scans? It's mild traumatic brain injury ruins people's lives and nobody knows about it because nobody looks at the brain. And anxiety disorders are one of the most common outcomes from concussions. No, I can't, yeah. It's obviously, it's, it just really hits home when you said that nobody, nobody's looking at it. Obviously, you have this, this massive database. Uh, but is it just yourself who's alone in the field uh, um, who's looking at the brain to do with mental illness? Or are you seeing some emerging people starting to look into it? Well, uh, Tan and I just finished the 30-Day Happiness Challenge. And... One of our exercises we did in the challenge is write down the 20 happiest moments of your life. And right in the middle of the challenge, one of mine happened. The Canadian Association of Nuclear Medicine, a prestigious scientific body that sort of oversees the brain imaging study we do at Amon Clinics, oh. came out with brand new procedure guidelines as if I wrote them. <laughs> it was so exciting. So I 
thing quickly that many more people are going to do the imaging work we do. And I've been doing it for 30 years and going, come on, how do you know unless you look? Exactly. What other medical specialists guess at what's wrong with the organ they're treating? And, you know, we really... The organ is the brain. And... <laughs> When your brain works right, you work right. And when your brain is troubled, you don't. But the idea that you can make a diagnosis based on symptom clusters with no biological data, that's insane, right? I mean, I'm a psychiatrist. I know how to diagnose insanity. And there's a level of hubris with that that's just not helpful. No. Because how do you know if the brain's working too hard or not hard enough? Um, how do you know if it's been hurt or it's toxic um, if you don't look? No, definitely. And just obviously going back to, to the imaging, obviously, that you've got a catalog of now. Um, if we're speaking about fame specifically, what does that look like on a SPECT scan? Um, what are the telltale signs of, of pressure and fame and celebrity? Um, it, it, would that brain have a, have a certain look? What we see is their pleasure centers. It's an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. It responds to dopamine. It is sleepy, that it's low inactivity and fame wears out the pleasure centers in the brain so when you're first famous it's so exciting mm -hmm. and you get so much reward and pleasure out of that so think of her first olympics and her first gold medals and it's like i can do this and that just makes me feel so good and we can't forget simone biles came out publicly saying that she has ADD. Oh. And what is ADD typically in the brain? It's lower frontal lobe activity, but also lower basal ganglia and nucleus accumbens activity. Uh, and so she's already starting with a vulnerability. Um, and I didn't say that. She said that. Um, and whenever something great happens, it produces a little bit of dopamine. And your nucleus accumbens feels happy about that. It feels reward. Mm. But if you push on that area too much or too often, so think cocaine, cocaine pushes on that area, makes you feel awesome for a bit. Mm. And then the repeated exposure to cocaine or fame or it can be any other drugs or gambling or sex or shopping or um, high sugary fat foods, they all push on the nucleus accumbens. Well, pretty soon it begins to wear it out and then you need more and more to feel anything at all. So does and that... Does that actually mean that too much pleasure can actually have a negative impact on the brain, though? It can. Yeah. And you have to be careful that pleasure can actually be the enemy of happiness if you're not careful. So in my new book, Your Brain is Always Listening, I talk about drip dopamine, don't dump it. Mm. And because, you know, dripping it... Um, telling my wife I love her, having eye contact, holding her hand. Um, last night I got to hold two of my grandchildren. Oh, fantastic. Um, that's dripping it. And you want a lot of, you, you know, sort of like a drip system to keep your plants healthy. Um, you, you have to sort of nourish your brain. But when you're dumping dopamine, when you're at the Olympics, when you're jumping out of an airplane, when you eat this very tasty but terrible food, when you're using drugs, alcohol, marijuana, cocaine, um, it sort of deadens that over time. Michael Phelps produced this documentary for HBO called The Weight of Gold. And, you know, clearly one of the most decorated athletes in history. 
but talked about his own depression. Um, I've seen um, 300 NFL players. Uh, We did the big NFL study, four times the level of depression is the general population. And you have to ask yourself why. And I wrote a post recently about competition. And I learned this early in my life. Never strive to be the best. Because when you strive to be the best, that automatically means you have to beat other people. And you have to put other people down. That is not a prescription for happiness. It's a prescription for loneliness. Strive to be your best. And in the process, bring other people along with you. Because you don't have to dominate another person or another team. You just have to go inside to be your best. And our mindset really matters, right? The brain matters, uh, but also how we think in this situation matters. Are we doing things to bring us closer to other people or are we doing things to push other people away because I have to dominate them? Yeah, 